Foss betrayed themselves before they even knew what the word meant. Let's look at the 10 gems that Foss tried to abduct to the moon. Ruchal's first words are a direct reference to their obsession with Pad Paracha. No matter what happens to the Lustrious, as long as you find enough pieces, they can be brought to life. That is the purpose that Ruchal dedicates their life to. The stubbornness that is attributed to Foss can also equally be applied to Ruchal, as the only reason they take on the niche in the Gem Society is so they can try to fit pieces of warm gems into the holes of Pad in the hopes of them coming back to life. Ruchal is the first point of reason within the series. When Morg and Goshen choose to not let Congo know about the Lunarians in Chapter 1, Rutile is there to fix them. When Foss gets some mercury on them, Rutile scrapes it away. When Foss loses their legs, Rutile is the one that gives them one last request as the natural historian. When Foss loses their head, Rutile allows for that shortcut of putting Lapis in place. When Foss comes back, Rutile is the first one Foss approaches to take up to the moon. Speech bubble composition is unique in Hoseki no Kuni. I talked about it in the previous moon video about how the bubble itself can be used in place of a full moon because speech bubbles are always full and circular and takes the forefront of the presence in the panel that the bubble lives in. However, there are instances where Ichikawa purposely places it behind objects. One such moment happens when Foss first wakes up with Lapis's head after the dream sequence. The disgusting details that Foss can can pick up with Lapis's intellect physically manifest in their gold arms getting placed on top of the speech bubble to accentuate the moment. It occurs again when Foss tries to manipulate by specifically drawing attention to the rows and rows of pieces Ruta has set up to test on pad that takes the foreground and overlaps the speech bubbles about the concept of synthetic gems to ignite a spark of hope in Rutel's ever lengthening quest to get Pad alive temporarily. Foss purposely manipulates these poor gems for their own desire. Enma's cherry picking of the truths is much more appealing than Congo's abstinence, so the betrayal that Foss wants to instill on Congo needs to work. But we know that even when Foss learns the concept of betrayal with Ventrocosis in the sea, Foss forgives her. Foss is even willing to continue to be a hostage because they feel empathy for the Admirabilis' goals. This empathy is twisted after the moon because Foss feels betrayed by the one that they would do anything for, Congo. That terrible feeling of trust is replaced and taken away from them and they don't want to be the only one feeling it. Even if all the other gems suspected something was off about Congo, their trust outweighed their curiosity. But like Rutal stated, these inclusions are relentless. The eternity of time allows for these emotions to morph so much more because we see Foss spreading their misery to everyone else, to tease out that pain and suffering of those around them. To achieve a goal of Foss's desire, guise is a solution to these gems' problems. Pick at their weakness and get them to act for themselves. This is Foss's main manipulation. They justify it because it does give the receiving end some closure, which they recognize from Periodot and Sphine that it gives a good conclusion and that feeling of resolution is desired by all, even Foss, even Kong. It's actually Foss's failure to get Cinnabar that Foss gives up on Rutile as well because they use the same line of reasoning that there is some technology on the moon that they can fix them. If Cinnabar refused and Foss doesn't understand why, they make the snap judgment that Rutile will also choose the same thing, hence Cicada going in and grabbing Pat's box. Foss understands that this is not treading carefully, a complete 180 on the advice Pad even gave them, and gives these gems a last out. Like mentioned in the Euclid's video, the timeline getting rushed causes Rutile to break because they would have actually gone if given enough time. If given enough time, Foss might have figured out why Cinnabar chose to stay and why Rutile is different and willing to go. However, things worked out in Foss's position regardless. Pad is up and alive. However, Rutile is the one that didn't make this a reality, that someone else took their job and therefore their existence breaks them apart. This is something Foss will come to understand with enough time, but not soon enough when it was needed the most. The gem's attention spans are pretty short. With the longevity of time at their disposal, even a gem's return from the moon like Foss 
loses its novelty very quickly when Foss is vague because they're just testing the waters on who will catch a bite first. Diamond, of course, seizes the opportunity, especially by laying out Yellow Diamond as a foundation. Daya understands very strongly of what Yellow feels as both are the hardest gems there are, but the weakest on the inside. We have been shown since Daya's introduction that they want the separation from Bort because every radical thing that they have tried to change wasn't enough to break the status quo. However, Foss, one of the weakest gems possible, changed so much throughout the story that they can't not be drawn to them. When they turned into a snail, or when they even brought up the idea of change, and even now when they come back from the moon. Just like how Bort wanted to partner with Foss after the winter arc, this is Daya's approach to see if the pairing is worth breaking the bond between siblings. Of course, this video is not a character analysis, as I've already done one on Bort a while ago, which you can watch here, and one day, Daya will get that same treatment. With the alley-oop that Daya gives Foss, Yellow is such an easy target. Both the framing of Yellow against the wall with the bed of flowers is perfect because they would rather just rest amongst their old partners to say that they were sorry for being weak. Foss's return brought hope, but with that hope led to despair because Yellow would have to come face to face with their failures instead of trying to forget the mistakes of a past lifetime. Yellow even tries to downplay Foss's feet, saying only someone like Foss could do it, even though it's safe to assume that Yellow Yellow definitely thinks of their old partners as special. Yellow just doesn't even try to run away like their introduction anymore because they have realized since the separation with Zircon, having or not having a partner still doesn't make them feel any better. For Daya, that distance from the earth to the moon is vital for their prosperity. For Yellow, that distance from the moon to the earth is the only place left to run to, towards those they let down. It's interesting how Foss recognizes the trauma of losing a partner and understands that reasoning is why Yellow wants to see their old partners because, of course, Foss would like to do the same thing, apologize. But so would anyone else such as Lex, Sphine, or Pierdot. Getting a gem a day is ambitious, almost as ambitious as getting 10,000 sufferers before the series ends. Benito is the most shocking to me when I first read the series. Benito, the one who goes, oh, Cinnabar is weird and just chills in the background, Benito. I couldn't really figure out why they are so interested, and I'm assuming Foss didn't either, but that little smile hidden in the lunar clothing was Foss seeing an opportunity, even the line by Benito, so I guess I kind of admire them, covers Benito's left eye, showing that the right is the one looking at the truth. But if you look back to their original introduction, Benito says something that actually spurs Foss on even before Diamond tells him to change, just living next to something unknown is scary. Scary, a gem that bothers people just by being around. That's what Benito thinks. That's what the general gem society thinks, as Benito can be seen as the everyday gem, the normal one. But normal people say some of the most harmful stuff. Normal people marginalize those they can't understand. Foss thinks they're a gem that bothers people just by being around. This is Foss's true motivation to help Cinnabar. Normal is not seen as good even though being special puts a different type of stress on an individual like Foss. If everyone loves you, you don't ever feel hatred upon you. Even that love becomes normal and you no longer feel as special. A safe way to practice being a part. Foss's own introduction with these gems was to test Foss with a partner since a trio would generally be too much, but these gems that act as one would be the best playground to see if Foss can be battle ready. The twins are the first time that we see that the dark spot itself is a material that can be damaged, but also we see how even a set of one cannot be free from the horrors of getting taken away. To show off to a junior that they've never had brought their hubris of almost getting captured. Foss who did nothing but run fast when trying to show off their features to the twins couldn't do it when it mattered the most. The twins themselves did not really process the trauma fully which led to this exploitation by Foss for the moon. Even with the volume 9 character introductions, Ichikawa makes it ambiguous as to which amethyst is there, but although Foss says it matters, it really doesn't and Foss doesn't care. Their only goal is to pull the rug up from under Congo with as many gems possible, so 33, 84, even both if Foss could have gotten away with it.
So let's let's run a let's run a tally, right? Diamond, check. Yellow, check. Rutal, uh, check for pad. <laughs> Lex, check. Although we didn't actually see them interact with Foss, which is a shame. Sphin, Pyridot, and Red Barrel are all bust. Benito, check. Amethyst, check. So five and a half-ish gems convinced, which is barely enough, but you know, time is limited when you have Enma literally watching your every move, Congo not reacting like you want, and Euclid hovering over your every single word. Goshen is the biggest toss up. Even Foss is like, what the? <laughs> what are you doing here? No one invited you. But if you think back to their first introduction in chapter 47, new Gosh is just 70 years young. Full of that ignorant energy of, I want to do cool things, so of course the chance to see a new place easily fits on their bucket list. I mean, look at how excessive and forceful young 300 year old Foss was at the beginning of the story. It's only fitting to have Goshen round out the moon gem party. Did Foss really betray the Lustrious? I think Euclid says it best where Foss doesn't tell if the moon is good or bad and only provides the details that each particular gem would latch onto the most. An apology for Yellow, a separation for Daya, a solution for Rutile, an admiration for Benito, vengeance for Lex, and a personality for Amethyst, and finally an adventure for Goshen. Foss plants these seeds in their inclusions so that they can ultimately arrive to the same conclusion to go to the moon. How is this any different from Congo existing and the gems loving Congo so much? They form a society around them, so much so that these gems will sacrifice their lives for Congo. Does Congo manipulate the gems? Does Euclid? Does Enma? Does Foss? You will have to decide for yourself. Don't let Foss and myself trick you. The final part of this moon trilogy will focus on the aftermath of the fracture of the illustrious society due to Foss's actions. I hope to see you there. Until then, peace.